So today's podcast is going to cover the anatomy, kinesiology, and biomechanics in terms of a general overview for the thoracic spine. As we get started, uh, some optional reading that I would kind of point your attention to would be uh, Raymond's uh, text, chapter 18, as well as Carol Oedis' text on kinesiology. Before we get too uh, into the thoracic spine, let's start with a brief intro. First, we need to recognize that the thoracic spine represents a transitional zone between the lumbosacral and the cervical spine. Both the lumbosacral and the cervical spine have greater amounts of mobility segmentally uh, than the thoracic spine. The thoracic spine is the most rigid region of the spine, and it is that way for a couple different reasons. First, it functions to protect the thoracic viscera. So where we find a significant amount of organs uh, that are crucial for vitality and life. And so the rib cage as well as the thoracic spine serves to protect those areas. Additionally, it functions to transfer and transmit load. And if you have a very mobile uh, segment or a very mobile region, load transmission is not uh, as, as easily uh, done. Now each of the thoracic vertebra is involved in at least six articulations. This is a change from what we see in the cervical spine, even what we see in the uh, lumbar spine. And because of that, <clears throat> there are uh, more areas that are prone to uh, potentially having some concordant sign or some pain provocation. Now why we see six articulations is because we also have the costovertebral joint and the costotransverse joint which articulate with the head of the rib and the costal angle articulating with the transverse process. Some research does propose that there could be as many as 13, though these are theoretical and it's um, it's, it's highly unlikely that there's that many. Uh, the clinical note here though is that establishing a specific cause of thoracic dysfunction may not always be possible because there are so many different areas that could be contributing or could be um, at least uh, overlapping in terms of symptom provocation. On the right hand side of the screen what you see is the combined flexion and extension that is available throughout the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar. And again you should uh, be able to appreciate that the thoracic spine, specifically the upper thoracic spine, is significantly limited in terms of the total amount of mobility. Additionally one of the more noted morphological features of the thoracic spine is the noted kyphotic curvature. Now this kyphotic curvature is present to balance out the more lordotic curvature that we see in the cervical and the lumbar spine. Because of this kyphotic curvature and because of the articulation of the rib, which you can visualize in the image to the right where we see the articulation of the head of the rib as well as the neck of the rib articulating with the costotransverse joint, um, the mobility of the thoracic spine is again relatively low, right? Uh, discs here are thinner. Uh, the ratio of the disc height to vertebral body is about one to five. Um, there is some evidence that would suggest that the annulus is stronger within the thoracic region than it is in the cervical and lumbar regions, which is another reason why we see a lower incidence of disc pathology. But another contributing factor is that uh, not only is the annulus uh, fairly strong in its ability to resist rotational stress, but by adding in the ribs, and the supporting ligaments, right? So if we look at this image for a second, we see the superior costal transverse ligament, we see the inferior costal transverse ligament, uh, other cross uh, sections can show various ligaments, the radiate uh, uh, ligament at the head of the rib and others. Um, and so all these ligaments, as well as the orientation and uh, structure of the ribs, they help to limit the total amount of mobility in the spine, thereby decreasing the incidence and prevalence of disc pathology. So even though the mobility overall is fairly low, that actually can have a protective function in terms of making the thoracic spine less susceptible to disc pathology.
The other thing that you can see and visualize with this uh, image is all of the demi facets and facet articulations for the rib as well as um, uh, for the intervertebral facets. This is uh, where we begin to get to that number of 13 that's been proposed, though many will uh, look at the superior and inferior demi facet of the vertebra above and below as one articulation with the head of the rib rather uh, than looking at them as separate. The typical thoracic vertebral body is more cylindrical and heart-shaped than what we see in the cervical uh, and then lumbar spine. It gradually increases in size as you move down, and so by the time you get to T12, uh, the, the body of T12 uh, takes on an appearance of the lumbar spine, whereas the body of T1 really looks like the cervical spine. There is a transverse process with a transverse costal facet which articulates with the rib. We see that. Uh, there's also a superior and inferior uh, costal facet. Those are the uh, demi facets that we just saw that allow for the articulation of the head of the rib. Additionally, when we visualize, we see the facet angulated at 60 degrees which is a change from the cervical spine where we see it at 45 degrees and the lumbar spine where it's going to adopt a position of 90 degrees. Because of that as well as morphologic changes we also see that the spinous process angles downward such that when you palpate the spinous process depending upon the level that you are um, you're likely palpating the uh, spinous process at the level of the vertebral body below. Okay, and so because of that, in the thoracic spine, we have what's called the rules of three. And so when you palpate the spinous process for the first three thoracic vertebra, they're at the same level of the vertebra. As you go down to four through six, it's about a half inch superior. Okay, and this is the distance of the level of the transverse process from the spinous process. Right. So it's not so much important when you're doing your CPAs as it is when you're doing your UPAs. Right. Your UPA should be directed um, uh, at the lamina and then also at the transverse process for the costovertebral and um, costotransverse joints. Uh, costovertebral would be pretty challenging, but just by movement, um, we, we theorize that we have some effect there. Really, we're targeting the costotransverse joint where uh, that would be the costal angle of the rib. But as we move down, we need to recognize that if we palpate the spinous process, we need to come back proximal, either half an inch or a full inch, to find our transverse processes. By the time we get to T10, it's one inch superior, T11, half inch, and then T12 is same level because it begins to take on an appearance of the lumbar spine. Now I've been mentioning the ribs um, and uh, the, the neck of the rib, the tubercle moving into the costal angle. Um, the head is the articulate uh, area for the facets. Um, that's going to articulate then with the inferior and superior demi facet of uh, the body of the vertebra both above and below. Uh, the neck is where we find the facet articulation for the transverse process uh, and we find the tubercle, the articular facet there. And then finally the angle gives the shape to the th uh, thoracic spine. So uh, the costal angle is where we begin to see the curvature uh, that then gives that shape to the rib cage. As we're going through elevation and depression of the ribs, uh, specifically with breathing patterns, uh, one of the terms that you will hear is pump handle and bucket handle. Pump handle is really associated with the sternum and the upper ribs, uh, typically uh, through T6. Here we see an increase in AP, anterior to posterior uh, uh, thoracic expansion, chest expansion, much like you would see a pump handle on a faucet. When we look at bucket handle, this tends to affect the upper as well, though um, also the lower ribs, T6 and below. And here we see an increase in lateral, medial to lateral dimension of the chest. And this is more of a diaphragmatic breathing pattern where our pump handle is more of an upper airway pattern of breathing. As we look at the joints of the thoracic spine, recognize there are numerous articulations, and this is where we see the six articulations. We have an intervertebral articulation, a costovertebral and costotransverse. We then have sternocostal joints and intercostal joints, and then finally facet joints. And recognize that many of these are paired one side unto the next.
For the intervertebral joints, these would be the joints that exist between the bodies, the discs, and the facets. The facet joints are angulated, as we noted earlier, at approximately 70 degrees. Uh, there is also a 20 degree angulation within the frontal plane. And because of this angulation uh, of the facets, this helps to contribute to the thoracic kyphosis that we see. The capsular pattern is that lateral flexion and rotation are equally limited. Uh, extension is less than flexion. For the costovertebral joint, uh, this is where the head of the rib and the vertebral body are going to articulate one with the other. Uh, the articulations really exist for ribs two through nine, and the rib then is named for the vertebra below, right? So for example, in this image we see T6 and T7, but it's the seventh rib, even though the head of the rib is articulating with both the T6 and T7 vertebral bodies. The joint surfaces are such that the facets are convex, uh, the demi facets are more concave of the vertebral body, and so this functions uh, really as a planar joint. Um, while we cannot reach this joint with palpation or mobilization, by impacting other joints it is thought that we can have a, a bit of a, of a, a reach though at a distance. <clears throat> Additionally, it should be noted uh, that the structural organization implies that impairments of the intervertebral disc may also result in injury to the costovertebral joint and vice versa, though as we noted earlier, um, the incidence and prevalence of intervertebral disc pathology is relatively low. Where we can see pathology develop and we can have an effect from a manual therapy standpoint is at the costal transverse joint. Now the costal transverse joint exists between the tubercle on the neck and the transverse process. There is no costal transverse joint at T11 and T12. Remember these are our floating ribs. Um, and, and not only that, but um, recall that the rib attaches to this joint at its corresponding vertebral level. That's why we say on the last slide, um, uh, really T2 to 3, T9 is where we see that interplay. Once we get below that T10, T11, and T12, the articulation is with the vertebral body itself. Um, the angle of the articulation here really depends on the shape of the facet. So as an example, uh, upper uh, ribs, uh, 5 through 6, um, run fairly horizontally, um, and so uh, their attachment to the transverse process occurs in the coronal plane. The lower, because they angulate up, so they, they, they go down and then they come back up to attach to the sternum through the costal cartilage, they run more in an obliquely downward uh, direction in the posterior aspect and then uh, turn upward into the costal cartilage. Speaking of the costal cartilage, uh, as we move into the anterior thoracic cage joints, this is where we find what are called the costochondral joints. Now the costochondral joints are um, an area that can be a site of sprains or irritation, inflammation, and when that happens we call it costochondritis. <clears throat> Now, uh, for these joints, uh, it really is looking at ribs one through seven. These are referred to as the vertebrosternal ribs, otherwise known as the true ribs. Once you get below seven, uh, from eight to 10, we call these more uh, the vertebrochondral ribs or false ribs. Some uh, will also include seven in this calculation. Uh, the costo, uh, uh, or excuse me, the vertebrochondral ribs, um, th they exist between the costal cartilage and the lower border of the cartilage above. For um, the chondrosternal joints, um, this is between the costal cartilage and the manubrium and the sternum. So let's look at the intercondyl joints, uh, specifically looking at those false ribs. Uh, again, those are the lower ribs, uh, so once we get below seven uh, and, and certainly eight, they are connected to the sternum, though it's indirectly via the costal cartilage of the superior rib. And uh, just like we see on the more posterior, posterior aspect, they are synovial joints that are supported by ligaments. For the facet joints, uh, these are consisting of the superior and inferior articular processes and their respective facets. And so you may remember that, again, the facet joints are angulated at approximately 60 degrees. Now, the facets are lined with hyaline cartilage. Uh, they are a synovial joint. There is a fibrous capsule with a synovial lining. And there's even the, the, the capsule um, uh, attaching to the periphery of the articulating members. Additionally, each capsule uh, does have a uh, neurologic innervation, 
and uh, can transmit uh, information related to proprioception and position sense. Now, as we're talking about these joints, it's important that we recognize, again, uh, a couple different planes uh, of the anatomy, right? Um, so in this view, we see a lateral view, we see a transverse view, and we see a posterior lateral view. Now, these views are really important because they help us to appreciate the significant ligamentous attachment that exists um, in and around these various joints of the thoracic spine. And this is important uh, for one reason um, among many, and that is that in clinical practice, you'll often hear clinicians say that the head of the rib is dislocated, uh, that they can palpate the head of the rib, things along these lines. Uh, and this is, this is uh, absolutely false, okay? Uh, first and foremost, uh, there is a significant transverse process that lies between your palpation and your ability to find the head of the rib. Uh, you're not going to be able to palpate it. It, it's just not possible. Uh, additionally, from there, uh, there is dense ligamentous attachment that holds these ribs in place, right? We have the superior costotransverse transverse ligament, we have the inferior costotransverse transverse ligament, uh, we have the lateral costotransverse transverse ligament, then we have uh, what's known as the uh, costotransverse transverse ligament, which is really serving as an interosseous ligament between um, kind of the neck of the rib and uh, the more kind of anterior portion of the transverse process, lamina and pedicle. And then uh, we also have the radiate ligament of head of the rib, as well as the synovial uh, uh, attachments for these different joints. So this idea that the head of the rib um, is, is susceptible to mobility and, and hypermobility and dislocation outside of, of, of high amounts of trauma like a motor vehicle accident, uh, uh, taking a blow to the rib cage, say for example in football where the, the, the crest of the helmet would hit someone is, is highly unlikely. In fact, uh, there's good research that suggests that the ribs are more likely to fracture than they are to dislocate. So we need to be very careful with our, with our phrasing and our vernacular here uh, because these words and these phrases can create um, fear avoidance, they can create uh, increased sensitivity in and by patients when they believe that their structures are susceptible to injury and damage. We've been talking a lot about the static stabilizers of the spine and, and some of the structural morphology and, and osteology. Uh, it's important to appreciate there are significant muscular contributions in and around the thoracic spine as well. We have a superficial and deep layer. There's also an intermediate layer that we'll look at momentarily. Uh, and, and with these, uh, again, there is a fairly significant um, uh, attachments in and around uh, the spine. Additionally, we see uh, multiple nerve contributions uh, around the thoracic spine. Uh, these are nerves that really are contributing uh, at each individual level. And so uh, with that, uh, we see uh, kind of an intercostal uh, uh, component here where we have uh, the ventral rami of the spinal nerve, uh, that being the intercostal nerve coming off of uh, the the central nervous system and then innervating all the way around to the more anterior portion. As we look at then the intermediate and deep layer of the thoracic spine, we can see uh, our paraspinals, uh, iliocostalis thoracis, spinalis uh, thoracis longissimus, and iliocostalis lumborum. We can also see the more deep layer, which is where we find our multifidi, uh, the rotatores of longus brevis, um, as well as um, uh, some of the inner transversi and uh, the intercostal muscles as well. Now we're going to transition here uh, and look at a bit of the proposed kinematics of the thoracic spine and ribs. And for this, uh, we're also going to cover some of this in our formal lecture, uh, but it's important that we, we give you a kind of a brief overview of this uh, as well. The normal range of motion we've already kind of looked at in the thoracic spine, uh, recognize that it is not a lot. Right. The theoretical ranges include a combined uh, amount of flexion and extension for 63 degrees, uh, with flexion being more than extension. Extension is rather limited. Uh, it's probably somewhere around a two-third, one-third ratio, though there are some individual variances there. 
so you're probably looking at about 40 degrees of flexion and 20 to 23 degrees of extension. The total amount of rotation is 62 degrees, which if we think about that, 62 degrees of rotation bilaterally, that's really only 31 degrees of rotation divided by 12 segments, right? At that point, you're looking at less than three degrees per segment, somewhere in the ballpark of 2.3 to 2.4 degrees of rotation per segment. And really at that level, we're talking about joint play. These are translational movements, right? Side bending is a little more at 68 degrees. Um, and we'll look at a coupled motion between rotation and side bending where it matters uh, which motion is initiated first. <laughs> The transverse plane uh, is where we find rotation. Uh, the, the amount of mobility is a progressive decrease um, uh, to only two to three degrees of rotation at T9 to T12. Majority of rotation occurs in the upper thoracic spine. Um, however, it should be noted that rotation is typically measured as thoracolumbar rotation. It's very difficult to isolate rotation only to thoracic spine and not receive any contribution from the lumbar spine. When we talk about frontal plane motion, um, we're talking about side bending. And the greatest amount of side bending actually occurs just the opposite of what we see with rotation. It occurs at T11 and 12 with approximately 9 degrees occurring there. So the greatest amount of lower uh, uh, motion is found in the thoracic spine from T9 to T12. And we see the same thing with sagittal plane motion where the greatest amount of motion is in, the, again, the lower thoracic spine with approximately 2 to 6 degrees of flexion extension per segment. And that is consistent with the graphic you saw at the beginning of this lecture. Additionally, um, if we if we kind of zoom in uh, specifically on the level that contributes the most, uh, that would be T11 and T12, which are approximately 13 degrees. And uh, this is where we're starting to get into the lumbar spine. And uh, at this point, uh, those those vertebrae of the thoracic spine start to take on more of a lumbar appearance. We should note that due to the relatively large amount of rotation that occurs in the upper and mid thoracic regions, uh, thoracic rotations tend to be more compensatory for lumbar immobility in the transverse plane. So the orientation of the facets in the lumbar spine are at a 90 degree angle. Uh, they lie in parallel and there's not a whole lot of rotation that occurs in the lumbar spine. The lumbar spine is primarily flexion and extension, a little bit of side bending, a little bit of rotation. So when we think of rotation, that's why we typically think of it as being thoracolumbar. We've mentioned the facets already, um, the, the fact that they are uh, 60 degrees in the transverse plane, 20 degrees from the frontal plane. Uh, but the reason we want to talk about it now with regards to kinematics is it is the orientation of these facets that guide the kinematics, right? So as an example, if we flex one vertebra on another, that is accompanied by the superior translation of the inferior facets of the vertebra above on the superior facets of the vertebra below, such that the inferior facets above are going to glide superior anterior on the more stationary uh, facets below, which adopt more of a posterior inferior orientation. Now this idea of coupled motion is similar to what we saw in the th cervical spine in the fact that uh, when we talk about coupled motion, it is a primary motion that occurs in one plane that automatically is accompanied by motion in at least one other plane. That means if in the cervical spine we rotate, we get side bend, and if we side bend, we rotate. That being said, there's significant individual variability. It's impossible for us to say that it's a one-to-one -one ratio or a two-to-one ratio. Rather, each level probably has some degree of variability. The same is true for the thoracic spine. Now the good news with the thoracic spine is your first four levels you already know because T1 through 4 is the exact same coupling pattern as we see in the cervical spine. Rather when we get to T5 through T12 the coupling depends upon which motion is initiated first. Okay so let's start with this idea of side bend. If we side bend first on the ipsilateral side to the side bending. So let's say we're side bending to the right. On the right side, because of the motion of the rib and because of the interaction of the rib, what's going to happen is we're going to end up with an internal rotation that occurs at the rib that, that results in more anterior mobility. And because the rib is rotating anteriorly, uh, it also will allow that more superior vertebra to move forward at the costotransverse joint, resulting in 
a component of rotation. So on the ipsilateral side, we get side bend to the right. We also end up then with a degree of translation. Now on the other side, the ribs are distracting and they quickly reach kind of their passive restraint of the intercostal muscle. And so what this does is it creates an external rotation at the rib. That rib moving in the external rotation or posterior direction will actually pull on the vertebra into a contralateral rotation. And it's this tension that creates the rotation. So therefore, if we side bend to the right, we get rotation to the left, and we also end up with translation to the right. So to summarize this, side bend initiated first to the right is going to result in side bend to the right, as well as translation to the right, but we get contralateral rotation. <clears throat> I should note, side bend and translation go together. The rotation is opposite in this case. Keep that in mind uh, for what we see momentarily when we look at what happens if we rotate first. If we rotate first, we get contralateral side bend and contralateral rotation. So again, the side bend and translation, they go together. Again, the motion is dictated by the ribs, such that right rotation is going to result in the transverse process posteriorly moving and the left transverse process anteriorly moving. What that does is it encounters the rib through the costo transverse joint, right? And that contact of the rib is then going to result in more posterior rotation of the right rib and anterior rotation of the left rib similar to what we saw with side bend. The difference now though is that when we rotate to the right, whereas before we had been side bending to the right, instead of getting side bend to the right, we actually get side bend to the left. And so we see that now as we move to the contralateral side. While we are rotating to the right, the superior vertebra accounts for that rotation, but because of the posterior rotation of the right rib and anterior rotation of the left rib, we actually end up with a side bend on the contralateral left side. And so if we rotate first, the result is rotation ipsilateral, side bend translation contralateral. Not unlike what we saw with side bending where side bending and translation were the same and rotation was different, contralateral. The same is true when we rotate, it's just a matter of, of which comes next. Spend some time with this. Compare and contrast. It very much is an if this then that type of scenario, but it does take a little bit of time to work through. Finally, we look at flexion and extension. Now, flexion and extension is occurring in the sagittal plane. And the good news here is that it's fairly straightforward. During flexion, the superior vertebra is going to translate anterior, and there's also rotation that occurs. Um, at the same time, the ribs follow that, and there's a bit of a roll that occurs. And so that motion then is also accompanied at the costal transverse joint, where we see a superior glide or slide um, occurring at that articulation with the rib. The exact opposite is true when we look at extension. During extension, uh, that superior vertebra is going to translate posterior and rotate posteriorly. Here again, we see an inferior glide at the costal transverse joint and a an posterior roll of the rib. So uh, again, we will, we will talk a bit more about this in lecture, um, but this brief introduction of kinematics uh, is important to begin to work through and conceptualize as you prepare to understand the thoracic spine as well as the interplay between uh, the costovertebral and costotransverse joints. So with that, we conclude our overview of anatomy, kinesiology, and biomechanics of the thoracic spine. Uh, certainly if there are questions, uh, consult your text or reach out as needed. Thank you.